All right, let's see if I remember how to do this. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. I'm John Kaiser, and we're gonna whip through this presentation hopefully within my 20 minute uh, budgeted time. Uh, the title is, uh, What Questions Worry Us the Most? And uh, there are a lot of them. This is a time to be worried in a very big way. So there's like, when is this damn COVID pandemic really gonna be over and life get back to normal? Um, then there's the question, is doing anything about climate change hopeless? Should we just uh, forget about it and start dealing with the consequences? And uh, this competition that's emerging between China and the United States, uh, is this the beginning of a new Cold War? or that will simply result in a fragmented global economy? Or is this setting the stage for what we used to uh, march and protest against in the uh, 70s, uh, that final nuclear holocaust that puts an end to everything? And then of course, more pertinent to the goal question, uh, is, uh, is this a supply chain disruption that we're seeing uh, temporary uh, and the inflation that's resulting from it transitory? Or are there structural changes in place that mean inflation's gonna be with us for a while and hopefully people eventually stop seeing Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation and go back to gold as the proper hedge against inflation. And then of course, what's been haunting the resource juniors all years, uh, when is the equity market and the bond market going to crash? Let's get this over with because we know we're gonna get crunched when that happens. So, Give them their 20, 25% haircut and then they can start rebuilding. We'll sort of bend in the wind a bit like reeds and then we'll bounce back and we'll have our turn. So the, the COVID thing, uh, you know, half the people are vaccinated. Uh, some are, are not vaccinated because they simply don't have access to the vaccine. Others have chosen not to be vaccinated. Um, right now we're in a, a, a bit of a, a lull, uh, uh, temporary, I think. Um, Canada's also in a good position. And you think, okay, maybe we will skate through this winter flu season without the kind of surge that we went through in the last flu season. But Russia is terrible. Eastern Europe is terrible, which of course, uh, there's a lot of anti-vaxxers there and it's not because they uh, uh, are upset that uh, the election was stolen from Trump. Uh, it's for other reasons. but. Germany is what's worrying me right now. Germany got vaccinated. Yes, there is an anti-vaxxer contingent, um, but why is it surging already? That is scary, and there's a sub-variant of Delta loose in Germany that's 10% uh, more transmissible than the original Delta. So I think uh, I'll, I'll be surprised if we get to be here in January at an in-person conference, I will be surprised if we don't have to endure one more nasty COVID surge. Now, the good news is a couple of weeks ago, F Pfizer said that they had surprisingly good trial results with an antiviral treatment that actually reduces, uh, even for uh, unvaccinated people, the risk of hospitalization and uh, death by 89% and they've asked for uh, emergency approval of this. this. This will help get this over with because even if you get it as a breakthrough, uh, despite having had your vaccines, you take this medicine and you'll just have a nasty flu that you need to endure. But until that's available, I don't think that'll be until after this Northern Hemisphere winter surge. So it, the COVID pandemic, uh, people think, well, this was this bad period for a couple of years that interrupted our lives and everything will get back to normal. Um, but I don't think things are ever going to go back the way they are. Now, right now, the supply chain problems are caused by China's COVID protocols and they are being extreme. They still want to have zero infection. So anytime they find somebody, they shut everything down. And expats now are wanting to leave the country because they can't go in and out without a three week mandatory quarantine. And the signs are China's gonna keep this in effect until the end of next year, which means this transitory supply chain problem is not going to go away. And the inflation that comes with it is going to persist. Now another big change that I think will stick is that 
city centres as a place where knowledge and information workers work, that's not going back the way it was. And, and where I live in California, there is an exodus already underway from like, the San Francisco area. People with all cash offers are buying the houses in the foothills of the Sierra. And you're going to start seeing the urban centers dispersed into clusters of you know, nicer rural, semi-rural, suburban areas with maybe a, a, a small industrial park where you go to uh, maybe a couple of days a week. Uh, but this idea of concentrated cities, I think that's uh, one that's headed out the door. Now, another, I think, long-lived implication of the COVID pandemic is that all these people, especially younger people and the workers, uh, who are at the lower, lower paying job, end of the, end of the job spectrum, uh, when the lockdown hit, that changed something with them. And as they're coming back, they're not willing to do the same crap jobs that they were doing before. And the gen, generation Z or Z in Canada, that group is particularly resistant to being, you know, putting their nose to the grindstone and sacrificing for a future of you know, family formation down the road. There's something bad happening and it's this end time psychology that has seeped into the, the, the public mind and the younger generations are catching this and they are also saying, I'm not going to do this for the future anymore. I'm going to live in the here and now. And that is going to help fuel the wage cost inflation spiral that we endured during the uh, 70s, except for different reasons. And uh, the other important thing that happened is with nothing to do, the younger generations discovered how to gamble in the stock market. The only problem for us, they were all into these momentum things like Bitcoin and Tesla and GameStop and, and other things like that. And the challenge for us is to have them discover what I call slow gambling, where you bet on fundamental outcomes that take time to evolve through the expiration cycle that juniors have to go through. So this, the lingering pandemic is going to continue to uh, hurt the juniors with these horrific assay turn, uh, turnaround times. This is really harmful because it, it, it prevents you from responding to results as to where to drill next. It also interferes with the funding cycles when you, you, know, you finally get your results from a summer program in December and it's like, okay, now you're supposed to finance a, finance uh, when, when there's not going to be a program until the following summer. And, and that's a problem. And of course, working in jurisdictions outside of Australia, Canada, and the United States, other countries, sort of the third world countries, it's still very difficult to fly in and out of that. And even some of them like Peru, which uh, worked hard to suppress the COVID pandemic, it still went nuts simply because of the way the culture works in that place. And then of course, uh, uh, the market just going for momentum gambling. It isn't good enough that people just buy our stocks when gold is trending up. We need them to buy a company because they think that the, the project will go into production or this target will turn into a gold discovery that may go into production. So the whole way of thinking about this space, we have to address that. Everybody has to become part of it. So the climate change question, the uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change uh, came out with a disturbing report where they said, uh, we didn't get this right. And not because we were wrong about the global warming and the impact on climate change, but we were wrong in that we underestimated how quickly we reach cascading tipping points. And uh, I read one thing, which is kind of sort of a disturbing story. Greenland sits on, it's a huge ice pack on it. The Greenland landmass is compressed as the ice melts, and of course they'll do this slowly, it will rebound and it's very slow, but, and you think, well, no big deal. However, on the margins is the continental shelf and the changing, which is relatively rapid on a, on a global time scale, on a geological time scale, will cause earthquakes, which will cause chunks of the shelf to fall off. And if anybody remember the Indonesia tsunami that killed 250,000 people? This will come down here 
and wipe out all of this. So these type of catastrophic risks are, are facing us. And, uh, you know, they're all fussing about the timeline for making these changes. Uh, it may not make any difference. These chaos-type events are starting to unfold in the fires we saw this year, the floods in other places. Uh, uh, this climate change moves the... the uh, ocean currents and then the Gulf Stream. One of the weird consequences could be a deep freeze in Europe because the jet stream ends up changing and so you have the normal weather cycles impact areas differently. And how many people here know that this northern half of the Sahara used to be a semi-tropical Eden maybe 50,000 years ago? It's hard to imagine, it's just a big pile of sand now. But it was an ocean current change, a weather pattern change, that caused that to become a desert very, very quickly. So the question is, do we stop wasting time on clean energy, just accept it and burn fossil fuels and start dealing with uh, where do we move all the people in Florida to and, uh, and, uh, and when all the places are burned down, where do we rebuild so they won't get burnt down again? Or do we try anyways. Now, even though it seems hopeless, well, before I get to the other thing, the failure to be, get serious about the whole climate change, it's creating a generational divide, and it's pitting the, uh, the boomers and, and, and the boomers' parents, who are now, you know, retirees, against the younger generations, and, you know, you get a Greta saying, well, all you guys are doing is blah, blah, blah. And so the bad thing that's potentially happening is that the younger generations also give up and say, well, you guys aren't doing anything about it, even though you have the dollars to do it about it, so we're not really going to do anything about it either. So we just end up in this global funk where nothing gets done and everything ends up going to hell in a handbasket. But there is hope. Now, everybody probably heard of fusion energy decades and decades ago. It's the perpetual, it'll be here in 20 years technology. But I think we may have reached a tipping point. Uh, a week ago, a, I think it's a Silicon Valley startup uh, called uh, Helion uh, Energy. They raised a half billion dollars to build the first uh, demonstration plant by 2024 to prove that they can get net energy out of it. The problem with all the current technologies is they, they generate electricity, but they spend more electricity getting there. But once you get over that hump, then you start converting, desalinizing um, a seawater and stripping the deuterium out of it, and it doesn't take much, and then you have almost an infinite energy supply. Now, this won't be commercialized until 20 years from now, but uh, when it is, it, it, it saves us, it changes the uh, cost of electricity dramatically. So what we have to sort of adopt now is, now to, okay, even though it looks hopeless in the interim, let's try anyways to shift to clean energy and hope that uh, this fusion comes in. And of course it means both renewables and nuclear energy will be obsolete, as will, you know, burning natural gas, except maybe, uh, maybe still for heating. But in the interim, we've got our uranium boom happening, and we've been through a terrible 10-year bear market since the tsunami uh, took out the Fukushima uh, facility, and uh, Germany gave up on, on nuclear energy, Japan paused nuclear energy, so we've been dealing with destockpiling of, uh, of inventories of uranium fuel, and that has killed the demand for uranium. And of course, there was no real desire to plan new, new uh, nuclear power plants except in China and those are slowly, slowly unfolding. Now the uranium boom that's happening now is really all about getting uranium back into the 60 to $100 a pound range. And the reason is simple, this below $60 price is a temporary consequence of this, these, these artificial events of destockpiling. Uh, similar to what, uh, you know, after the, uh, the, the Soviet Union collapsed, we had all this decommissioning of former nuclear warheads and that coming into the market when that was all gone, and then China came on board with its new plans to build a lot of nuclear power plants. Then we had that ramp up. But there was a problem that uh, came along as part of that, which is Kazakhstan. And as for um, the, uh, 
when this will really take off, we're looking at 2028, 20, 30. So I'm not so keen about uh, you know, roll front type deposits in the United States, but I think this is a good window to take a look at the Athabasca Basin again and look for the high grade deposits that will work very well if we have 60 to $100 a pound uranium. And this is the problem I'm talking about. Kazakhstan came out of nowhere, is the world's biggest supplier, does in situ a recovery, so it's relatively cheap. It has enormous resources. It will be China's future client, so whenever, whatever you want, what you think of uh, China's future needs are, Kazakhstan will serve it. But countries like France remain committed to nuclear energy. They will want um, uh, uranium from, from, uh, from places like Canada. Now, this here, the collapse of Canadian supply, it used to be the, the largest, then it was the second largest. Last year, it was actually in fourth place because Canada shut down MacArthur River and said, this is stupid. Why should we mine our richest uh, uh, deposit at, at or below cost when we can just go in the spot market and fulfill our long-term contracts, mopping that up from the utilities and reselling it to the utilities that still need it? So we're going through that process of cleaning up all that. Cigar Lake will come back on stream. Kazakhstan will get its various uh, in situ leaching recovery circuits going again. So the, there, there won't be a demand supply demand imbalance until you know, eight, eight, nine years from now. The key thing is, will nuclear energy, will there be a push to have more nuclear energy? Because you need it as base load. Until they have proper long-term storage for renewables, the intermittency is going to be a problem. Of course, the fusion dream is the possibility that we get saved in 20, 20 years for sure this time. But I think for now, as uranium rebalances into this uh, 60 to $100 range, we'll have a bull market for exploration and at least for talking about the companies with their roll front deposits. Now, electric, oh man, are we running out of time here? Electric vehicles are here to stay. The weird thing about when Trump was in power and you know, pumping fossil fuels and that, the car industry globally ignored him and continued to transition to the point where we were shocked last year at how advanced they had come. But even though electric vehicles have gotten up to you know, maybe three, three, four percent of what's being produced out of the 100 million cars a year, it's not going to break out until we have a proper battery. And that battery needs to recharge as fast as it takes to refill your gasoline tank. It has to have the same range as a gasoline car. It has to work in extreme hot and cold temperatures. Uh, it cannot be a runaway fire hazard where the dendrites from the lithium puncture uh, short circuit it and all of a sudden you have a, a car that's seriously on fire. It's got to accelerate just like an ice car and it must be have a low enough cost at the low end so that the 99% the that can't afford a Tesla will end up buying it. And I think it's 2030 and the most fascinating arms race right now is the uh, battery technology race. What battery configuration will inherit the universe in 2030 and become standard like a lead acid battery? And the only metal that we know for sure will be part of it is lithium. And now you're seeing the scramble to secure long-term supply. This company, Neo Lithium, has a $960 million cash bid from Zhejiang Mining, which is normally involved in gold and base metals. There's now a scramble to secure these uh, metals from these other places. And where, do, where does uh, lithium come from? Well, brines, pegmatites, and clays. And it's basically been sort of Australia and Chile, but Argentina is coming on stream, and China because it's committed to the electric vehicle transition because of its dependency on oil imports. It's an extraordinarily, extraordinary vulnerability, strategic vulnerability for the country. They have to do that. And then there's all these uh, clay deposits, such as, say, Cyprus has in Nevada. These are a third potential source of lithium. But lithium's, the theme of lithium is going to be with us for some time, and I think I, uh, I guess this is. You can see the, uh, what's happened 
to the price. This was the first little lithium bubble and then it collapsed. But now, now it's serious. It's not going to go significantly higher, but in these price ranges, a lot of projects are worth figuring out and developing. And don't forget rare earths. China still controls most of it, though not as much as it used to. And rare earth, the magnet rare earths, are going to be part of the electric car future. And the heavy rare earths needed to keep the, 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 the permanent magnets from demagnetizing under higher operating temperature conditions, they are a problem even for China in terms of long-term supply. And we're not going to get a bubble like this going again, but as you can see, uh, that the magnet rare earths are starting to perk up and we may see them end up here. And that's where rare earth stories start becoming interesting again. The uh, geopolitical conflict between China and America, that's a serious problem. Uh, we, we saw them test their hypersonic uh, missile, which can deliver a nuclear warhead now to you know, almost anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, their Pentagon is alarmed that their AI progress, uh, that, that by 2030 they may have outpaced the United States with uh, artificial intelligence technology. And we know China has its own internal problems, domestic problems with its energy supply, um, and the fact that the uh, common prosperity policy of Mao Zedong 2.0 that Xi Jinping is pushing is going to cause a lot of internal unhappiness. They need a distraction, a patriotism generating distraction. So. Taiwan's just sitting there waiting to be annexed. And when that happens, it changes everything. The world fragments into two different uh, economic zones, or probably several economic zones. And, and here's just the visual. This convergence of global, the share of global GDP between China and the United States, that's on track to being equal by 2030, barring any catastrophic disruptions along the way. So this is why ESG is not something to, to thumb, thumb your nose at. ESG is critical to the Western democracies weaning themselves off dependency of the lowest cost jurisdiction that is becoming back to an you know, old-fashioned communist dictatorship in some sort of hostile relationship with the United States and its and its allies. And this is good for juniors because when you start having the consumers insist on ESG credentials, then the producer has to secure metals from places where they can say, yeah, no, we didn't dump everything down into the backyard of some, some person in China there where, where, where they are powerless to prevent it from uh, being dumped on them. No, we did it in Canada where they have hideous, uh, horrific permitting rules and that we did it properly. So pay a premium for our product and the producer will, or, or, or the user will pay a premium for the deposit. So it opens up the world for the resource juniors to find smaller deposits uh, uh, in, in, in safer jurisdictions with this ESG credentialing in place that allows them to have an exit and they don't always have to find a Voices Bay world class. There are the, the spectrum of what counts as a success opens up, it isn't this like one in a thousand companies eventually find something every, every 10 years. So inflation, you know, the figures came out again and it's uh, the real rate on a one, one year T-bill is now minus 6%, that's really great. That means you're on your 0.2% interest that you're getting, you, you also get to pay tax, tax on the interest income, plus you're losing buying power. And I'm of the view that we have this inflation is going to be around us for a while. And the best way to deal with that is to uh, create a depression. And hopefully that's not what it's in the cards. Let's hopefully they keep things motoring along. But we now have a narrative in place for the traditional, okay, there's inflation, you need to own gold. And, and gold, uh, you know, you take $400 gold in 1980, inflation adjusted to pre present, and that's $1,322 is where it should be trading at if it is a true infl inf in inflation hedge. But it's at uh, uh, 1800 there as an average for the year. That's 40% higher at the 1860 price. That's 50% higher. This market has not yet grasped that we have experienced in the last year and a half, two years, a real price increase in 
in the uh, in, in, in in, in, in gold, and that lowers the bar for what counts as economic. Now, yes, costs will come up, but they're not anywhere near as high and fast as what we're seeing as this real price gain. And I'm waiting for the market to realize that for expiration and developing these ounces in the ground, this is going to happen uh, uh, sooner than later. And again, you see this. Gold's been a dog all year. The ETF's been losing gold all year as people pile into Bitcoin and other things. Hopefully, this starts reversing. It hasn't yet, even though gold's had a good week. There's no real sign yet people are piling into it. But we'll see what happens with that. And this is, of course, what we worry about. This is the uh, 1920 and um, uh, 2010 sort of normalized here and tracking. We see the similar crashes, the similar recoveries, then the long depression crash that results in FDR's election in 1932 or something like that. But we've motored on. We're now heading into new territory, and we're terrified that this is going to crash. You want to solve your inflation problems? You want to solve your people not wanting to work problems? Create a depression. Except I think if they do engineer that, uh, what we end up maybe is what the Germans ended up with, uh, that, uh, that guy uh, whose name I will not mention, instead of an FDR. So that's stuff to worry about. But if you choose not to worry about it, and this is not going to uh, happen, we are looking at a future of rebuilding infrastructure, adapting to a new energy infrastructure. All of that's going to be a big macroeconomic driver. Things are going to look good going forward. People will dream about fusion energy. And, uh, and metals like copper are going to stay strong. They're not going back to 250. What we're seeing now is probably the base for higher real prices down the road. It's not going to be the same sort of super cycle as we saw coming uh, coming out of, out of here when the China took off, but it's still going to be good for the sector. So there's a path can take many futures, uh, for, uh, but uh, what, what do you do if you love the resource juniors and can't uh, just give up on them? Well, support the ESG movement, as I suggested. Bet that gold will continue its uptrend in, in real terms. Uh, uh, Bet that end timer parties are not going to end up in charge and create some sort of autocracy. And then learn this concept of fundamental outcome gambling, the discounted cash flow model, all, how that all works, and then teach younger people how it works too so that they can participate in a different type of gambling than momentum gambling. And then dream about fusion energy. It's not going to be a divine intervention that saves the world. It's a, it's a future that... Uh, uh, it will change everything. In fact, our sector dies because the all mineral is about energy consumption. You lower the cost of energy, you have an energy revolution like that, and super low-grade stuff suddenly can be processed. It will, what we're doing now will become obsolete also, but that's 20 years down the road, and I'm not worried about that. And then I have to uh, wrap this up quickly. Uh, look for companies that aren't just exposed to one project, that have hedged themselves with plan A, B, and D, C. And I'm just going to quickly whip through the companies that I've got lined up. P2 Gold, plan A, is the GABS project. That's an existing copper gold system that they're rethinking, figuring out the economics, benefiting from the better copper gold prices. I'm not going to get into the, uh, you know, all my uh, uh, rational speculation model stuff. But uh, I've done an outcome visualization, and you see uh, um, proper good enough IRR. This is what I think their PEA might look like. Base case prices are reasonable. CapEx is this, but this is higher than this. So that's what they need to fix. They need to get the after-tax NPV higher, maybe find more tonnage, better grade, reduce costs uh, uh, lower than what I have in there. So that's their challenge. And, uh, if we are in a speculative market, this would be trading in here in an S-curve market, but we're in still a slightly better than a super pessimistic rational market. And we'll skip that. And uh, this is something I've got on my website now. I do milestones to keep track of what's supposed to be coming. Plan B is their BAM project in the Golden Triangle. It's uh, a new discovery. It's peripheral to what may be a deeper 
porphyry system, maybe a red Chris type of thing. They'll be working on that next year. And plan C is their original project, Silver Reef, which is a silver, lead, zinc, uh, uh, CRD style project that they will also eventually go back to to see if what they think is there actually is there. And endurance has become a gold discovery delineation play. It's now in that space where it should have S-curve activity, where it trades a lot more than what it is, and they've got assay results pending, and Robert will tell us about uh, why the reliance system is so interesting and what the growth potential there is. And uh, Plan B is their Elephant Mountain project, a lower grade intrusion related system in Alaska, uh, where they need to go in with a serious budget, which they haven't been able to do because of the bear market. So if we get a strong gold market, there'll be people wanting to farm in or give them money to get this done. And the jewel, in my mind, in their crown, is the Bandito project, which I think is bigger and better than Strange Lake and better located. It's a heavy, rare earth, enriched intrusion. This play could solve the world's heavy rare earth needs almost indefinitely. It needs some work to upgrade. It's not their priority. If they ever get it going, they would probably spin it out. DLP resources, they are in that traditional Sullivan two hunt. They're ready to drill again on this project that they latched onto a, a year ago. This is the kind of play where if they hit a Sullivan or even something half of Sullivan's size, becomes like a Hermosa Taylor, a $2 billion buyout type thing. They don't have a gazillion shares out like uh, Arizona Mining did. So this is the kind of play where overnight a discovery hole could give you extraordinary upside. Their plan B is Hungry Creek, a sediment hosted uh, copper silver system in British Columbia. Also a product of uh, David Leo Pegan, who's the DLP is named after. And plan C is the Aurora project, which is something different, it has nothing to do with Mr. Pegan, and it's in Peru, and that's a rethink that has to do with Vice Exploration VP uh, Ian Gendel's background in that particular part of the world. And then there's Forum Energy Metals, which plan A a year ago with Janus Lake, but now it's, it's, rare, it's uranium portfolio on which it spent over 30 million bucks during the first uranium bubble. Um, that's now front row center, and they've got a new property that wasn't part of the original one, where they've got some good ideas, and Rick's gonna tell us about why that Wollaston project's special. And then they have the Love Lake project, the nickel platinum palladium group uh, uh, project for which assays are pending. And then Janice Lake, uh, that's looking for an Udo can in the northern Saskatchewan, Rio Tinto's the partner. It's uncertain right now how much more money will Rio Tinto will spend. But uh, uh, there's been a lot of work done, 14 million spent, no real discovery yet confirming it's world class, but only a third of that whole property package has been looked at. And thank you for your attention.